Well, good afternoon, everyone. What a beautiful afternoon we have to assemble together um, and uh, lift our great God up in praise and worship and, and study his word together. Great to see, uh, let me see, we got 42, 42 connections, households gathered together that we might come together, blend our voices in praise and in prayer and in study of God's word. Grateful for the presence of each and every one on this beautiful Lord's Day afternoon. Uh, George Smith is going to lead us in our first hymn of praise, and I encourage all of us to set all the stuff of this temporary world away from our hearts and minds and focus them in on those higher things, eternal things. Uh, after that first song, um, Roger Cobia is going to uh, do our scripture reading from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 29, 18 through 27. And then George will lead us in two more songs before Brother Willie Washington directs our minds in prayer to the Father. So I encourage all of us, let's uh, join in heartily as we worship our great God, Lord, and Creator together this afternoon. Brother George. Okay, so Proverbs 20, 29, 13 through... All right, we'll begin, begin with, uh, I stand in awe. You are beautiful beyond description, to marvelous for words. Too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty throned above, and I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. reading from Proverbs chapter 29 beginning at verse 18 where there is no revelation people cast off restraint but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction servants cannot be corrected by mere words though they understand they will not respond do you see someone who speaks in haste there is more hope for a fool than for them. A servant pampered from youth will turn out to be in insolent. An angry person stirs up conflict, and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. The accomplices of thieves are their own enemies. They are put under oath and dare not testify. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Many seek an audience with a ruler, but it is from the Lord that one gets justice. The righteous detest the dishonest, the wicked detest the upright. Next, I'll sing, I Need Thee Every Hour. I 
need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can be so forth. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. Stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, for life is pain. I need Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thine indeed, Thou blessed Son. I need Savior, I come to Thee. Before the before the prayer, we'll sing them. We'll sing "Healing in Its Wings." Mm. Oh, Father, I do sin, and my heart. Deep within, for you have sought me, yet I turn away from all your loving care. So often do I fall, yet you reach out again. My burden, that is all that I can ever bear. Through your beloved Son, there is grace so undeserved. How can I ever say? against the one who makes my heart to sing. Create a heart so clean that like you I may be as light of morning rises up with healing in its wings. My broken, contrite heart is so worthless in my sight. But you restore it 
Give it peace and joy to love and follow you. Oh, may I ever strive to live your in your sight, filled with your goodness, free to glorify and honor you. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and all the blessings that you have given us. We're thankful for the opportunity to be able to study your word, to have the avenue of technology, to be able to worship you in a time when we're not able to get together. We pray that everything we do is acceptable unto you. We pray that you would continue to watch over us during this time. We ask for strength. We ask for patience. And we ask for love for our, bro our fellow mankind <clears throat> in times of trials as we are going through at this very moment. We pray that <clears throat> as we go through this service tonight, we pray that you would uplift us with your word. We pray that you will implant it in our hearts. And we pray that as we go about our lives and we are able to see other people and contact others, that we will share it with them and let them know the glory of your creation, the glory of your word, and all the things that you do for us on a daily basis. And let them know that this is something that they can obtain. And let us just share all your glory with those we come into contact with. Father, we pray that you would watch over those who can't be with us, those who are sick, that dearly need our prayers, and we know that you are watching over them, and we just pray that you would continue to do so, and that you would give them the reasonable amount of health that you want them to have, and we pray that at some time, if it's your will, we pray that they will be back with us again and be able to worship with us again. Father, just continue to watch over us and be with us as we go through this service and make sure that <clears throat> if there's anything that we do that is not in accordance with your will, we pray that you would open our eyes to it and that we can correct these things and make it right with you. All these things, Father, we ask in your blessed name. Amen. Amen. Before, before Brother Bill speaks to us, he'll sing, This World is Not My Home. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise trip back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. 
If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can be left home in this world anymore. Okay, here we go. All right. Well, glad everybody's back this afternoon. I've been asked to speak on this subject, and it's been a while since I've looked at this subject, and so it was good for me to go back over it. And I, I think it, and I hope it'll be helpful for you. And please, as always, I mean, if you have a question, you want to ask me a question about it, uh, please feel free to text me or write me or call me or some way get a hold of me, and let's let's talk about it. So I want to talk about evil spirits, demonic possessions. I mean, what, what does the scriptures teach about that question? And so there are any number of places that we could go to talk about it. And to be sure, th these evil spirits, demonic possessions, there were some in the Old Testament that indicates that the evil spirits were there and so forth, but not as much as they are in the time of Jesus and the apostles. I don't think we see him as much. One of the things that I, I noticed about all of this, and we will look at uh, just a few. We certainly don't have time to look at all of them, but to just look at a few of them will help us understand what the Bible teaches. But I want to say this. You know, it's interesting to me, and it, it, <clears throat> I don't know why I've never really caught on to this before. You know, Jesus said in John 17 that, you know, he came to make God's name known. I think there's just an easy way of saying that everything God did and everything God does is so that people will know who he is, will know his name. And I think that's I true. Think I, I, you good, know, yeah. that that's what he did in dealing with evil people. That's what he does for good people is to make known who he is, to make known his name. So when we think about uh, evil spirits and demonic possessions and what the scriptures teach about them, uh, what we understand is that God is showing his power is greater than any evil power that there is. So somebody says, well, why, why do you even want to talk about something like this? And I want to just suggest to you that there's just a lot of misunderstanding associated with, with this particular subject and that people uh, struggle with it in different ways. Uh, the word exorcism is only used, as far as I know, in the New Testament one place, and that's in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. And what that word really means is just an expelling or a getting rid of. It's not just a religious term. It's, it's used in other disciplines as well to exercise something or to, uh, you know, medicine uses it, talking about getting rid of a disease or, or expelling something from uh, that's causing some, some challenge to the body or something. But exorcism just simply means getting rid of or expelling. And in general, in the New Testament, it was done by appealing to the name of Jesus or uh, appealing to one who was in power, namely God, to exorcise the uh, evil spirits. Why talk about evil spirits in our demonic possession? Because it is a Bible subject. I mean, if you turn into Mark 5, verses 1 through 15, and we just read that one there. It's a rather lengthy one, but, I, but I'm not going to read all of them anyway, so I'm going to read just this one. And we're familiar, I think, in some ways with this. Uh, some months ago, I preached on, use this for a text. But beginning in verse 1 of Mark 5, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met a man, met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountain, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. 
For he was saying to him, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they began, begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he let them, so he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what, what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus, saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had, had had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So here is just a classic case of, of a man being possessed of a demon and possessed against his will, being clothed in his right mind. That's an interesting statement. Uh, similar to the, the uh, prodigal son coming to himself uh, after having spent all that he had and ending up in the hog pen of life, he comes to himself. A little different setting, but nonetheless coming to his right perspective, to his right mind. Then over in Mark, the seventh chapter, you have the Syrophoenician woman and in verse 25, uh, the, the text reads, but, imme uh, but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread, throw it to the dogs. But she answered, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumb. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. So here's another case. I, we could talk, we, I preached not too long ago on this. Uh, <clears throat> but here again, I'm just showing that this is a Bible subject. And, and what the Bible talks about, we ought to talk about. We ought to address and, and discuss what it means and talk about these evil spirits that the Bible talks about. Not only did Jesus perform exorcisms, but, you know, when he sent them out on the limited commission in Mark, the sixth chapter and verse seven, he gave them the ability to cast out spirits. One of the more interesting things about him sending them out on this limited commission was when they came back and they were all excited that they had uh, had this power to cast out unclean spirits and so on and so forth. Jesus says, look, look don't, don't marvel over the fact that you can do these powers, but marvel over the fact that your name is written in heaven. Listen, there are some things greater than being able to perform miracles. And Jesus said one of them is having your name written in heaven. And so every one of us ought to be concerned about, is my name written there? That's, that's, and you think about having the power to, to cast out demons and so forth. That'd be pretty, pretty cool to be able to do that. that. That would get you a lot of notoriety. But what would be more important was to make sure your, your name was written in heaven. Uh, we go to the next point here, and we see that what Jesus is talking about, I'm not reading any of these, but these are just some that you can uh, look at and, and examine for yourself. Uh, the copy of these charts are certainly available to you, as all my charts are. Uh, it was real, and they could only come out by a supernatural power of God. That's the point. So here are some other cases in the New Testament, certainly not all of them, but, but a number of them that you, that you can look up for yourself and understand that this was a real problem in the first century and could only come out by the supernatural power of God. So we continue thinking about this and then come to our chart here. Did, did these supernatural powers exist during the days of the apostles or what we sometimes refer to as the church age, uh, the church, the, the dispensation of the church? You know, we have the patriarchal dispensation from uh, from Adam all the way through to Moses, and then when, from Moses to Jesus, we have what is referred to as the Mosaic period or dispensation. And then from the time of Jesus, sometimes uh, to the end of time will be the church age or the church dispensation, the Christian dispensation, however you want to say it. So during the period of the apostles or the church age, did, 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 did these uh, demons exist and so forth and, and so, forth, so on? Well, uh, if you have been here for our Bible studies with Matthew Conley, you, you certainly know that Acts 16, verses 16 through 18, through an evil spirit uh, and uh, able to practice uh, divination and fortune telling. That is, when they came to the city of Philippi, you know, the apostle Paul 
It says in Acts 16, and I will read this one. These are just a couple of short verses. But they'd come into the city of Philippi to preach, and there greeted him as he came into the city was uh, this place. He said in verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Listen, this is a, this, this fortune telling, it's, it's a lucrative business. And as is, it, it is today. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she did keeping, keep doing for many days. Paul having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And so you, you, you see them at that time during the days of the apostles. They were very active. They were still working. I'll have a little bit more to say in some regard about this. But also in Acts the 8th chapter, back up to Philip going into, into Samaria. And there we see in verse 6 and 7, And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had, who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. So it seems to me that we could say on some level, demon possession was a very common thing during the early days of the church. Now I know there's some questions here, just, just stay with me here. So what was the benefit of this demonstration? Well, for what reason was this power given to the apostles? Or we might say, what was the purpose of miracles? You know, from the very early of beginning, Exodus, the fourth chapter, teaches us the purpose of miracles. You remember when God had called Moses at the burning bush to take his, his children, his people out of the land of Egypt? And you know, Moses began to make excuses and so forth. And, and in Exodus 4 and verse 1, Moses said, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. You know, we, you know, we usually get pretty excited about that. That's pretty cool, especially for little kids uh, to, to think about uh, doing that. But we need to keep reading further because that's not the whole story. He said, but the, verse 4, but the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So, so here is, is Moses telling us from the very early times that miracles were performed to authenticate the one who was preaching and claiming to do something in the name of Jehovah. Verse 6, it says again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak, and he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside the cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. But if they will not believe even those two signs, or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from Nile, pour it out on the ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So all of the things that God did was to make known his power, his name, that this was, that, that God was greater than anything uh, that man had ever seen before or will ever see. So Exodus 4 actually teaches us very early on the purpose of miracles. Now, God's reasons for his miracles in the New Testament are, are the same as they were in the Old Testament. You know, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Listen, this was a new message in some ways uh, to, to, to the world. And so, especially among the Jews who were so entrenched in their tradition and their long standing with the law, and here comes one well, saying, no, God said, now you have to believe and be baptized. That there's a new covenant and all of their traditions were going to have to go uh, to the side. I mean, that, it would take a miracle, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind. It would take a miracle to convince people who had long, for, for 3,000 years or so, had been entrenched in this sort of, uh, or at least 2,000 years, had been entrenched in this 
this religion and, and it had been approved of God and now there's a change. And so in, in Mark 16, after he tells them this, he said in verse 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues and they will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he'd spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them, the apostles, and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. And so that, that the miracles they performed was to confirm the word of God. Hebrews 2 verses 1 through 4 makes almost the same point. Uh, that, you know, as he warns them uh, to take heed to the things that they've heard, which at any time they should let them slip. And then he talks about the message that, that, that they were supposed to listen to and pay attention to. It was that message that was first spoken by the Lord and confirmed by the miracles that followed. So God's reason for his miracle was to, for confirmation to authenticate and to validate that what was being said was done. He said in verse 4, while God also bore witness to Hebrews 2, by signs and wonders and various miracles, my gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So what was the benefit of this demonstration? Was to show that God was far more powerful than any demon that ever lived. So then the question is, well, how, do we see this power in operation today? Was this power to cease? Well, the truth is both evil, both the evil power of the devil and the good work of the Holy Spirit were going to end simultaneously. I think we can prove that from the scriptures rather simply. Now, if you turn in your Bibles to Daniel, the ninth chapter, and we're going to have to do a little digging here in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, but you recall this is Daniel, the 70 weeks of Daniel, and he's seeing all of the things associated uh, with, with, with the Messiah. And so in Daniel, the ninth chapter, and uh, at verse 24, he said, <clears throat> 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. And so you see, this was a time in which iniquities were going to be atoned for. Well, when was that? That's the time of the Messiah. But notice what else he said, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, listen, to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place. So there's going to come a time that when, when, when uh, God paid the price for iniquities through the punishment of his son, that visions were going to be sealed up. There would be no more. There would be no more prophets. Prophecies will cease. And I have three C's there. That could be Conley, 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 because when I tell you it's context, 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 who tells us that? Matthew says that all the time. And so if we look at the context of Daniel 9, 24, he's talking about the time of the Messiah. And what he's saying is that at some point, the visions and prophets and prophecies during his time are going to cease. They're going to come to an end. But that's not the only place we can go to. Turn, if you will, in the book of Micah, the fifth chapter, and we're familiar with this particular prophecy of, of, of uh, Micah, in which he uh, prophesies of the birth of Jesus. Micah 5 and verse 2, he says, But you, O Bethlehem of Hathoreth, you are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel who's coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Of course, we recognize that as part of the, the messianic prophecy of, of Micah. And we continue reading it in, in Matthew, in Micah 5, and look at verse 12 and verse 13. Notice we start to verse 10. And in that day, that's the messianic day, that's the day when Jesus would come, he declares the Lord. Then in verse 12, he said, I will cut off sorceries, from your hand, and you shall have no more tellers of fortune, and I will cut out your carved images and your pillars from among you, and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. So when you think about this particular prophecy here, many things that the Jews do today are not right, are not acceptable to God. But here's an interesting fact. 
since their return from the Babylonian captivity, they have never worshiped idols. That's the reason that they went into captivity to begin with, because they worshiped idols. They seem to have learned their lesson. It's quite a different story from the Egypt, from Egypt to the return from the exile. From the time they left Egypt till the time they were taken exile to Babylon, that's what it seems like they, they constantly worship idols. But he says, well, in that day, when the Messiah comes, he's going to cut off all the idols, and they're no longer going to have sorceries and tellers of fortunes. All of that was going to cease. Well, we still have another one. Look again in the book of Zechariah, right, right, right before the book of Malachi, right after Zephaniah, chapter 13. Notice, on that day, and most of the time, especially among the minor prophets, when you say in that day or on that day, that has a reference to the Messianic period. But he said, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. So when is that day? When Jesus comes to pay the price for their sins. But drop on down just a little bit, if you would, and notice in verse 2. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idol from the land. No more. And so that they shall be remembered no more. Listen now. And also I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. And so he said there's coming a time when he's going to do away with these unclean and these evil spirits and so forth. They're no longer going to operate. God's going to show his power over them. So how is this power to be overcome? Well, by the power of Jesus Christ. We'll do a little bit of reading here real quickly. Uh, Matthew, the 12th chapter. And you'll recall this is where they had accused Jesus of casting out demons by Baal or by the demons themselves. And Jesus tells, that's where Jesus says, you know, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And then goes on and gives them a little parable in Matthew, the 12th chapter, beginning verse 28. He said, an enemy... Uh, Get the right chapter here. Chapter 12 and verse 28. He said, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house? This is the devil. How, how, can, how can someone enter the devil's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man, unless he first overcomes him? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters, uh, does not gather with me scatters. So Jesus uh, talks about it again in, in the book of Luke, that he is the stronger than he that comes in and overpowers Satan. Let's look at some passages out of the Gospel of John very quickly here. And in John, the 12th chapter, and we'll look at John 12, John uh, 14, and John 16. In John 12, Jesus has made this point, or is making this point to his disciples, beginning at verse uh, 27. He said, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for, but for this purpose I have come to, the, to this hour. What purpose? What was the purpose? Said, for this purpose I've come, I've come to this. His death is imminent. John 13 begins the last discourse with his disciples the Passover, and so forth, right before he goes to the cross. So he says, now, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Well, Father, glorify your name. Look here, glorify your name. There it is. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Then the crowd that stood there and heard it said that he had, it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. He's going to lose his power is what he's saying. That's the purpose for which he came, was to destroy the power of, of the devil. Look at John, this time, the 14th chapter in verse 30. Remember, this is where he started that wonderful chapter, let not your heart be troubled if you believe in me. If you believe in the Father, believe also in me. If it were not so, I would have told you that wonderful passage in which he talks about what he's going to do. And then in verse 30, 
he says, um, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. Underscore that in your mind or your Bible. He's getting ready to judge the ruler of this world, and he has the right to judge him because the ruler of this world has no means by which to hold him to the grave. Remember Peter when he preached on the day of Pentecost, it was not possible that he should be holding by the pangs of death. Why? Because the devil had no, he had not sinned and the devil had no claim on him. Go over to John 16 and verse 11 this time. He said concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So Jesus' purpose in coming and being lifted up and, and being resurrected was to destroy the power of the devil. Look at Hebrews 2 this time, beginning at verse 14 and verse 15, and listen to what the writer of the book of Hebrews encourages them who are in danger of going back under the law to avoid persecution. He's saying, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, Jesus himself, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. You know, if the devil entered you and took over you like he did in the first century, you might think you're never going to be set free. Jesus came to destroy the power of the devil. He came to destroy him. Yes, I believe that, 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 that the evil spirits and the unclean spirits that we read about in the first century overtook people by their will. Uh, Colossians, but we'll talk about that some more. Colossians 1, verse 13. Colossians 1 and verse 13, uh, the text reads, He, Jesus, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the rule or to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have the forgiveness of our sin. Now, jump over with me, if you will, to verse, uh, starting chapter 3, verse 12. And he says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. In other words, in baptism was an operation of God taking place. The same power that raised Jesus from the, from the dead raised us to a new life, having forgiven us of our sins. And only God can do that. But read with me some more. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And what else? How'd you do that, Lord? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That is, by not charging us with sin, he, he, he paid the price for our sin, and so he canceled our debt. And then he said, listen, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in it. He triumphed over the power of evil and over the devil. He made an open triumph over them. He put them to shame. They no longer have the power and rule over us. And so what we see in all of this is that this power was overcome by the power of God. That is, this power over unclean spirits and so forth. Now, don't make any mistake about it. Satan is still alive and active. But he has no more power over a man today than what that man allows him to have. There was a time against their will that man served the devil, but no longer. But Christ's resurrection forever took that power away. And that's what he's reminding us of. When did this power cease? Well, Evil and unclean spirits existed when miracle existed during the time the miraculous power of God operated. And so, you know, for every positive, there's a negative. And so they, they both ended simultaneously. Uh, and the reason that they existed, as I said, was to show God's power over the devil. And so anybody that was filled with an evil or unclean spirit, by the time of the first century, ended, they were gone. They ended simultaneously. And so we have those records. So when we turn to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, those three chapters, the 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 through 11, he enumerates the nine gifts of the Spirit. And the irony is, is that verse 1, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts, but I want to tell you something. 
there is no, there's more than enough ignorance to go around today about spiritual gifts if you listen to people. But it's in verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 12 that Paul asks some rhetorical questions. Uh, and when he says in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 29, he said, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? See, 1 Corinthians 12 is enumerating the spiritual gifts. Now, out of those gifts that people were given, there arose a controversy. Not everybody had the same gift. Not everybody had a gift. And not everybody who had a gift had a gift that was as prestigious, I guess, as another gift. And so they would, you know, just typical human beings, they, they begin to fuss and argue about it and made some feel inferior because they didn't have spiritual gifts. And so Paul said, look, not everybody's an apostle. Not everybody has spiritual gifts. Not, it's, but he said, listen to me. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. So listen, if, there, if there's a better way than spiritual gifts, that's the way that we ought to want. Why would we want something that's inferior? I want the better way. I'm going to show you a more excellent way. In fact, the word way here is the word highway. Same word for highway. And so what is that better way? Love is the better way than spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are inferior. Verse 8 begins to show how the gifts would cease. Notice the 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Love never ends. There's no stopping love. There's no ending point. It doesn't terminate anywhere. The cessation of miraculous manifestation from both God and Satan were going to end. And so he said, that which never fails, never ceases to exist, versus that which will pass away. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, that is speaking in tongues, they will, they will stop, they will cease, they will no longer exist. As for knowledge, it will pass away. That is the miraculous gift of knowledge. Right here, and I've got it somewhere in this, but I'm going to stop here and explain that to you. In John 16 and verse 12, Jesus said, I have many things to say unto you, and you are not yet able to bear them. How be it, when he the spirit of truth has come, he shall guide you into all truth. So the apostles never at one time during the period of, of spiritual gifts knew everything there was to know. They revealed it in bits and parts as was needed. And until the complete revelation of God was revealed, God used these miraculous manifestations or these miraculous gifts. So he said this, this prophecy of knowledge or this uh, gift of knowledge, this is what he said was going to pass away. Now look at verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Here we go. We know in part. That is, gifts were just partial. They weren't the complete deal. We prophesy in part, a little at a time. You know, and so they didn't know everything. Everything was just beginning to be revealed in bits and pieces and parts. And so what he's saying here is those things until that which is in, uh, perfect comes and that which is in part will be done away. Look at verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, verse 10, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When the perfect has come, James 1 verse 25 talks about the perfect law of liberty, referring to the final completed form of the revelation of the New Testament. That's the perfect that's coming. What were the spiritual gifts doing? They were revealing the knowledge of God. They were authenticating that the message that was being preached was from God. And so when that message is completed, when the thoroughness of that message has come to its perfect end, then, the, then these which were in part are going to pass away. Verse 11, notice he uses this growing up process. He said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Spiritual gifts are for children. When, 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 when Christians and, and New Testament Christianity was in its infancy, didn't have leather-bound volumes of the Bible, God didn't chuck those down from heaven to people in a leather-bound version. He revealed them through the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, through inspired men, through the prophets, through teachers, and so forth. 
And he said, when that which is perfect, when the completed revelation comes, then that which is in part, the spiritual gifts, that's which guided us through our infancy, we're going to put away. You know, little children go through phases with toys and so forth. They get too old for some of their toys. Go watch Toy Story sometime. That'll help you understand what he's saying here. In verse 12, then he says, he illustrates again the picture for us, the same porn as John 16, 11, and 12. He said, for now we see, for now, underscore the word now here, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. In other words, because we don't have the completed revelation, it's like looking in a really dark glass. We can see a faint image of ourselves. We can see different things, but we don't see the entirety in its clarity and so forth. And what he says is then now I know in part, but then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. In other words, I'll be able to see myself as God sees me when the revelation is completed. I'll totally understand how it is that God views me and I'll see myself for who I am because I will come to know face to face with God. And then he says in verse 13, now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now we have all these things today. The fruit of the Spirit basically is what faith, hope, and love is. Now hope's not mentioned there, but the faithfulness and, and love certainly are. But the end result of the fruit of the Spirit is the hope that we have in Jesus. And then verse 13 says, then, you see, uh, as opposed, I'm sorry, then uh, refers back then to uh, how they knew partially and so on and so forth. But now, he says, by the faith, hope, and love. This is the better way through love, is what he's saying. We turn to Ephesians 4 very quickly and notice again those miraculous gifts. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this. This is almost the same as the other, but I, it makes a couple different points. Beginning of verse 8, he says, but, a, but great, uh, verse 7, but grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, that does not mean that he had also descended in the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who has ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the ministry of the work, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So all of these gifts that Jesus gave us were to bring us to the unity of the faith until, we, until we're able to grow up. And yes, we've come to the unity of faith. Romans 10 and verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Remember in John 20, John reminds us that the things that he wrote, these things were written that you might believe, and believing you might have life in his name. We have everything necessary to know. There's nothing that God has left out that he has not revealed, and so there would be no need for us to have a continuation of the spiritual gifts. They were given to authenticate, to reveal, and to validate the message was from God. That message has been confirmed right here in this book, the Bible. And so it's been confirmed. We have everything necessary that we need in order to, to go to heaven. So the demon possession today, as I said, we have all the need to be full grown, grow up into him until he be formed up. No, prophecy from the Old Testament said that it would cease. Uh, no one has this power today, the soothsayers or fortune tellers and so on and so forth. Kind of reminded that story where the woman said to her husband, said, you know, I said that, uh, I'd like to have, I'd like to go to a mind reader. I'm not sure if I, I'd like to go to have my fortune told. I, I, I'm not sure if I want to go to a mind reader or to a palm reader. And he said, honey, you have a palm. I'd go see the palm reader. And so I think that that's probably what we need to understand, that it's just a mindless thing that people fret about today about demon possession and all of those sort of things. Jesus Christ is the power that we have today. And this power was present in ages past, yes. But it has been sealed up. It has been stopped. No one can do these miracles today. No one can 
The demon, uh, Satan cannot overpower us. He has no more power over us today than what we allow him to have. Listen, those who claim to cast out demons are false teachers. If you go back to Acts 19, which we're coming to in our study, if the evil spirits could take control of a man today, then the false prophets who are claiming to cast them out would be beaten by the evil spirits. You see, because the evil spirits in Acts 19 recognized and obeyed the Holy Spirit as he operated through the man, uh, through the apostles, and obeyed his commands. But these, there were seven itinerant exorcists among the Jews that went around claiming to cast out evil spirits. When they came upon the man, the, the, the spirit said, we don't know you, and came out and beat him and beat the seven sons. And so, you know, if it were true, that's what would happen today. So that's my lesson really on the spirit and on the, the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit that, and demon possession, that, that we are living in a time where the Bible is all we need in order to go to heaven and that spiritual gifts are uh, no longer in existence. And so the devil no longer uh, has power. He's been beaten by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He triumphed over him in it. Jesus said he has nothing in him. When he could raise it, when God could raise Jesus from the dead because he had no sin in him, the devil had no claim on him. That's what he's saying. When he said the devil has no claim on me, he said, I haven't sinned. The devil can't hold me. And so he raised victorious. And when he was raised from the dead, he brought to nothing the power that the devil once had. And so the devil knows his time is limited. So if you have some questions about this or about your relationship with God that I can help you in any way, just let me know. I appreciate you listening. Thank you. George? All right. Before, before closing comments and prayer, we'll, we'll sing Anywhere is Home. Mm -hmm. Earthly wealth and fame may come to me and a palace fair here mine may never be but let come what may if Christ for me doth care anywhere is home if he is only there Anywhere is home, let come and go what may. Anywhere I roam, keeps me going all the way. So for his dear sake, my cross I'll meekly bear. Anywhere. Is home if Christ my Lord is there. Oft I'm tossed about and driven by the foam. Sad within, without, wherever I may go. But I pray. For it's all sweet home, if Christ is only there. Anywhere is home, let come and go what may. Anywhere I roam, he keeps me on the way. So for his dear sake, my cross I'll meekly bear. Anywhere is home, if Christ my Lord is there, I will labor on till I am called away to the morn. Child on my glad eternal day, looking on 
to him who keeps me in his care. Anywhere is home, if Christ my Lord is there. Anywhere is home, let go and go what may. I think we can truly say it's been a wonderful day that we've been able to come together in this capacity to worship the Lord and study that perfect uh, revealed word of God that's been preserved down through the ages for us. Good to see so many members of our church family and I think even a few uh, visitors with us tonight. We're certainly grateful for the presence of everybody. want to encourage everyone to keep praying for all those that we uh, mentioned and uh, talked about this morning. Don't forget uh, Bill's Bible class on the Book of Job this week on Tuesday and Thursday morning. Don't forget our singing Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We encourage everyone to join us come together there on Tuesday evening. And then of course, Wednesday, if the Lord wills and he tarries, we will come together again and study God's holy word, seven o'clock on Wednesday evening. Don't forget who we are, why we're here, what life's really about, um, just passing through. I love that song, this world is not my home. You know, our citizenship, is in heaven it's not here we're just passing through maybe this very night we'll get to go home and be with the lord before john birch leads us in closing prayer i want to reread isaiah 41 10. i think a very encouraging powerful uh, verse i read it this morning i encourage all of us to take it with us as we go into this this week this work week and uh, let our light shine and be the people that, that God wants us to be. Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and surely I will help you. And surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God can create the universe, the world and hold it together, there isn't nothing that can separate us from him, from his perfect love and will, and let us rest in that and take that and go into this day and live for him, live for Christ. Brother John. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the time we've had to spend together in worship to you and singing praises and coming to you in prayer and listening from your word. We pray that we might all have been strengthened by our time together. We pray tonight, especially that you'd be with Connie and Richard as they are away from us, that you'd be with them as they travel home and keep them safe. We pray for David and Brenda who are also away. We pray for Eric, his brother, that he might be strengthened, that the doctors may help him more. We pray for Johnny May, as the doctors work with her anemia. We pray that she might be strengthened, Father. And with Patricia, Carrie's mom, who has pain and is in need of your soothing care. We pray especially tonight for the family of Joyce Huff, as they miss her and know that they will not see her on this earth again but help them and help us to know that she is in your presence, Father. And we could not deny that. We should rejoice over that. We pray tonight you especially be with Bob, that you would strengthen him, 
that you would give him an easy transition to you, Father. Be with Helen, be with Graceland, that they each might be strengthened and regain their health. And we pray, Father, for all of us as a family, as a nation, as the world deals with this terrible virus. We pray, Father, that it has been a wake-up call to many, that they are in need of you. Help us to find ways to bring people that we know closer to you as they are in any way more disposed to hear that. Forgive us, Father, when we sin. Help us to strengthen one another. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John.